Hey everyone, Wolf Lauro here. Today we are kicking off our Scattering Week special. A week of conversation dedicated to the Primarch Scattering. Was it engineered by the Emperor? Was it allowed? Or was it all simply down to the ruinous powers? Well, that's what we're going to discuss. And where better to begin than with Chaos's version of events. Spoiler warning to begin as the events we're discussing today are from the Horus Heresy novel False Gods by author Graham McNeil. As always, I really recommend you read the stories for yourself first without spoilers, as that's the best way to enjoy the lore for yourself. But with that said, let's just jump straight in. So the scattering. The greatest what if in 40k history. What could have been if the Primarchs had been raised on terror? Assuming of course that was the plan. There are those of course who insist that it wasn't. That the Emperor never intended the Primarchs to remain on terror by his side. That he planned for them to be raised across the galaxy. And that he was fully aware of the Chaos God's intentions. That he allowed them. Perhaps it's right, perhaps it's wrong. But as far as the Gods of Chaos are concerned, the Emperor was far from innocent. There are many examples throughout the heresy of the ruinous powers trying to throw doubt on the Emperor, pitching their cause of righteousness to his sons, attempting to sway them to their side. And for me, the absolute best example of this has to be the most famous one, the iconic moment of Horus Lupercal's fall. Way, way back all those many years ago now, within just the second novel of the Heresy series, False Gods, we saw the cause of chaos spoken to the weakened Horus, the momentous events of Davin. As Horus Lupercal lay comatose and wounded, Erebus, disguised as Sejanus, would come to the dreaming fallen warmaster. And there, at the behest of the great intelligences of the Warp, as he would call them, he would claim to show Horus Lupercal the truth. It would begin with a glimpse of the future, a shrine world of the Imperium, the future Ecclesiarchy. There, amid the thousands of crowding pilgrims, beneath golden statues of his brothers and his father, he would learn of the Emperor's worship as a god. A future according to Chaos, the Emperor had foreseen and had always intended. A future to come, where the Emperor would forsake Horus and claim the godhood he truly desired. And as much as Horus wanted to believe it wasn't true, wherever he looked, he could find no trace of himself. Now, we the reader know full well why Horus was not represented in the statues, nor any of the other traitor Primarchs. Because this future Horus was shown was indeed the future of 40k as we know it. One where, yes, the Emperor is worshipped as a god. For all apparent signs, quite possibly being or being on the cusp of godhood. Yet this, as we know, is not the future the Emperor wanted. That it was actually the future brought about by Chaos themselves. By Horus. A pretty significant detail they choose not to mention. And without that important detail, Horus's omission to him is not readily explained. He was the war master after all, the chosen of the Emperor. Yet of course this alone wasn't enough to sway the war master. And thus it was after this that Horus would be shown the depths of the Imperial Palace, the Emperor's laboratory and the Primarch Project. Here, surrounded by the capsules of all 20 Primarchs, 
the emissary of the dark gods, would go all in, play all of their cards, and show their hand to sway Horus to their side. The true reason the Primarchs were made, and how. To conquer the galaxy for humanity, said Horus. No, not for humanity, for the Emperor, said Sejanus. You already know in your heart what awaits you when the Great Crusade is over. You will become a jailer who polices the Emperor's regime while he ascends to godhood and abandons you all. What sort of reward is that for someone who conquered the galaxy? It is no reward at all, snarled Horus, hammering his hand into the side of the silver tank before him. The metal buckled and a hairline crack split the toughened glass under his assault. He could hear a desperate drumming from inside and a hiss of escaping gas whined from the frosted panel of the tank. Look around you, Horus, said Sejanus. Do you think that the science of man alone could have created a being such as a Primarch? If such technology existed, why not create a hundred Horuses? A thousand? No, a bargain was made that saw you emerge from its forging. I know, for the masters of the warp are as much your father as the Emperor. No, shouted Horus. I won't believe you. The Primarchs are my brothers. The Emperor's sons created from his own flesh and blood. And each a part of him. Each a part of him, yes. But where did such power come from? He bargained with the gods of the Warp for a measure of their power. That is what he invested in you, not his paltry human power. The gods of the Warp? What are you talking about, Sejanus? A little slip or crack in the argument there, by accidentally referring to the gods instead of the intelligences of the Warp as before. It's no mistake that that term was used, as here, immediately, we see Horus react to the word gods. Sejanus, in truth, Erebus, was very careful beforehand to not use it in reference to the ruinous powers. And the slip is clear, not only by Horus's reaction, but by Sejanus's immediate follow-up, as he claims what does it matter what I call them? Xenos, intelligences, creatures, gods. He knew full well a reference to gods would be an issue for a Primarch raised, dedicated to the Imperial truth. But throughout this whole interaction, we see the arguments made that the Emperor didn't conquer the galaxy for humanity, but himself. At a time perhaps arguable, maybe still believed by some. However, for me, it's an argument that was surely put to bed in the final days of the Siege of Terror. Within Volume 2 of The End and the Death, when the Emperor forsook the power he was assembling to face and defeat Horus. The United Four, instead deciding to do it as the man he is, even in knowing full well it meant he wouldn't be able to win. We know the glory, the prestige, the recognition was a big factor in Horus Lupercal's makeup. We saw it before in his argument with Malkador, when the statues of the lost Primarchs were being removed and his clear feelings of superiority over mortal humans, that it was the Primarch's place to rule. So the argument of Horus being cast aside, discarded without reward for all of his efforts, it's a very powerful one. One clearly aimed for this Primarch. Because as we've seen with certain other brothers, it wouldn't find that crack to manipulate, as it does here. And the revelation that the warp was used in the Primarch's creation, 
that it wasn't solely the Emperor's genetics, his science, that the Immaterium too is within them. A revelation we've seen shock and hurt all of the Primarchs who have learnt it. But what does this have to do with the scattering? Well, everything. Because this is the argument of Chaos. This is all of their pitch to Horus. The argument that swayed him to their side. It shows the dubiousness of their argument, and it shows the successful exploits of the Emperor's own secrets. The creation of his own sons. You can have your own opinion on if the Emperor stole the power, or if he came to the gods offering devotion, as Sejanus would claim. But it's the simple fact it speaks to a hidden truth, at the heart of it all, that allows the rest to be a possibility. There is no pain that cuts deeper than betrayal. And that is what Chaos tries to expose here. And this is where the scattering comes. Sejanus would inform Horus that the gods, unable now to strike at the Emperor directly, would strike at the tools he needed most. The generals of his armies of conquest. The Primarchs. And Horus would witness the warpstorm beginning within the laboratory. Six custodians, Valdor included, would burst in at the sound of the alarm, finding Horus and ordering him to cease his witchery before opening fire. And Horus, dropped to his knees by the blows, would launch into action, easily dispatching five of the custodians swiftly before only Valdor remained. And just as Horus was about to kill the chief custodian, the warp storm above would scream as it reached its pinnacle. Horus paused in his attack, suddenly terrified for the fate of those inside the tanks. He turned and saw one tank spewing gases and screams as it was ripped from the ground, following others as they were torn from their moorings and swept upwards. Then time stopped and a blinding light filled the chamber. Horus felt warm honey flow through him, and he turned towards the source of the light, a shimmering golden giant of unimaginable majesty and beauty. Horus dropped to his knees in rapture at the sight. Who would not strive to worship so perfect a being? Power and certainty flowed from the figure, the secret of creation at his fingertips. The answers to any question that could be asked, there for the knowing, and the wisdom to know how to use them. He wore armour that gleamed a perfect gold, his features impossible to know, and his glory and power unmatched by any being in creation. The golden warrior moved as though in slow motion, raising his hand to halt the madness of the vortex with a gesture. The maelstrom was silenced, the tumbling incubation tank suspended in mid-air. The golden figure turned a puzzled gaze upon Horus. I know you, he said, and Horus wept to hear such a perfect symphony of sound. Yes, said Horus, unable to raise his voice above a whisper. The giant cocked his head to one side and said, you would destroy my great works, but you will not succeed. I beg you, turn from this path or all will be lost. Horus reached out to the golden warrior as he turned his sad gaze to the incubation tanks held motionless above him, weighing the consequences of future events in the blink of an eye. Horus could see the decision in the figure's wondrous eyes and shouted, No! The figure turned from him, and time snapped back into its prescribed stream. The deafening howl of the warp spawned wind returned with the force of a hurricane, and Horus heard the screams of his brothers amid the metallic clanging of their incubation tanks. Father, no, he yelled. You can't let this happen. The golden giant was walking away, 
leaving the carnage in his wake, uncaring for the lives he had wrought. And there it is, the scattering according to chaos. The Emperor arrived as the storm reached its zenith, and froze time with a mere fault, clearly and undoubtedly having the power to stop this desperate gambit by the gods in motion. And despite the pleas of Horus, his future son, he chose instead to allow it. Now, there's some key lines throughout here that I want to highlight. The first, the golden figure turned a puzzled gaze upon Horus. I know you. This isn't the Emperor stating he knows Horus. He's asking. There's a question mark there. I find that a little curious and odd. Yes, this is Horus apparently visiting the past, or at least seeing it, a time when the Primarchs were still in their birth capsules. But I'd still expect the Emperor to recognise Horus here. We've seen him converse with Belisarius Call before, in a similar situation, knowing full well who Call would one day be and what he would one day do. So if he knew the mind of Belisarius cool enough to have no doubt, I would surely have expected him to have foreseen enough of his own Primarchs to recognise them immediately, especially considering they were so integral to his plans. For all the various futures could change, as hard as it was for the Emperor to see different paths ahead, you wouldn't have thought the appearances of the Primarchs would be something that would change. But hey, admittedly, this was written many, many years before Belisarius called the Great Work, and we know how much things such as foresight can change in the lore. The second is, the giant cocked his head to one side and said, you would destroy my great works but you will not succeed. I beg you, turn from this path or all will be lost. Horus reached out towards the Golden Warrior as he turned his sad gaze to the incubation tanks held motionless above him, weighing the consequences of future events in the blink of an eye. So it almost feels here that the Emperor thinks Horus is attempting to destroy the Primarchs, at first, I thought he must be talking to the gods of chaos, as he would always do with Horus during the Siege of Terror, for example. But that second part of, I beg you, turn from this path or all will be lost, that only makes sense if he is talking to his son, to one of his primarchs, Horus Lupercal. And then, how it appears in this moment, Chaos is not only arguing the Emperor could have prevented it, but that here he calculates the possible future and consequences of them being taken from Terra, and allows it, doubling down on that betrayal to Horus. Not only could the Emperor have prevented it, but he actively chose to have all the Primarchs torn away separated from each other, from him, and scattered across the galaxy. That he considered and allowed for so many of them to grow alone, vulnerable to tragedy, totally and completely uncaring. All summed up by the line, the golden giant was walking away, leaving the carnage in his wake, uncaring of the lives he had wrought. You really get the feeling here that this version of the scattering wasn't so much to reveal a truth, but to give a hurt, to showcase the selfishness of the Emperor. That argument of chaos, that he never cared for the Primarchs, for Horus, for even humanity, that he was simply using all of them, the entire time, 
on his own quest for godhood. Again, it wasn't a conquest of the galaxy for humanity. It was a conquest for the Emperor. Now does that make it all a lie? Or does it make it all the truth? I think as I've said, there's more than a few questions to be asked in Chaos's story here. However, you cannot escape the inescapable truth that it does expose a lie or secret of the Emperor's in the realities of the Primarch's creation. And where one lie is exposed, the doubt begins to fester. So, the scattering according to Chaos, one where the Emperor came to them, offering devotion, where he was gifted their great power, and betrayed them, seeking only his own godhood instead. And in their desperation, they struck out at the only thing they could, the Primarchs. Yet even here, the Emperor could have prevented it, saved his sons, kept them together on terror, with him. Yet he chose not to, not only chose not to, but in doing so, allowed the lives of suffering so many of his sons would face. As always everyone, what do you think? Is this the truth, or is it a simple chaos manipulation? A clear attempt at trying to pry Horus away from his father's side. We know it would ultimately work here, so does that reveal it must have been true? Or does it instead reveal the flaws in the sun? Or where the Emperor simply made his own mistakes? For me, an undoubted Emperor loyalist, it's pretty clear where I fall on this argument. However, again, we cannot escape the inescapable truth that chaos does reveal at least one lie here. And where one lie is exposed, who says there can't be more? But as always everyone, leave your thoughts in the comments below. Huge thank you to all my subscribers, your support truly means a lot to me, it really does. If you're new, please consider subscribing to help the channel grow. And if you enjoyed this particular vid, then why not drop a like on it too. But with that said, I am off, and I'll see you all again tomorrow as we continue our scattering discussion.